Today I'll be making an A-stable multi-vibrator. Get your mind out of the gutter. A multi-vibrator is essentially a circuit that has separate states, and it can go between those states. Generally, you think of it as timers and oscillators and that sort of thing, but anything similar will do. The common type of multi-vibrator is going to have two states. You have A-stable, monostable, and bistable. A-stable means it's not stable, A-stable, not stable, in either state. It'll be in one, but then it'll flip to the other, but then it'll flip back and forth and back and forth. So this is where your oscillator comes from. A monostable, mono for one or single, is stable in one of the states. If it's in the stable state, it'll stay there. If you manually kick it out of that state, it'll go through a process and it'll get back in that state and then it will start sitting there again. Bistable means it's stable in both states. So whatever state it's in, it'll just stay there and you can kick it to the other state and it'll stay there and you can kick it back and it'll stay there. So a monostable would be more like a timer. So you kick it out into its unstable state and then after a certain amount of time it goes back to the stable state. So you could have like an alarm. And bistable would be something like a flip-flop, a storage unit. It stays whatever you set it so you could turn it on, turn it off, and it'll just chill and you can read that value. So that would be like a bit of memory. But today we're making an oscillator. Now, I'm going to do this in two videos so it's not too long. The first video, this one, I'll show you the circuit, describe it, and show you the actual thing on a breadboard. The second video is going to be the actual explanation because the explanation is involved in long. I will do it simply, but simply doesn't mean quickly. So today's video is going to be a hand wave of just take my word for it. The next video will actually explain it. So let's see what the circuit is. So the parts we will need for this are two NPN transistors, BJTs. Let me see if I have my backwards one here, and I do. So we'll have a transistor here and a transistor here. This is another one of those beautifully symmetric, satisfying circuits. So we also want two capacitors. And I am going to use electrolytic capacitors here because once again, the ceramics, the nonpolars don't come big enough for this purpose. But you can use the smaller ones. You have to adjust your other values. Let's just put it there. In this case though, the amount that will be driving the capacitor backwards is minuscule, only a single transistor junction bias. So an electrolytic is going to have no harm from this. So it's perfectly fine and safe. We'll also have two primary resistors. These are actually going to be driving the circuit, the timing part of it. We're going to make two RC networks, resistance capacitance. And so the values of the capacitor and the resistor are going to be timing the oscillation back and forth. Then we have our load. This is the thing that we're actually doing. So we'll have resistors there. And then for my load, I'm going to have LEDs. I'll clean this up in a minute. Now your load could also be having the lines go out to junctions of transistors, like a BJT, a JFET, a MOSFET, or whatever. You could run motors or whatever. It would be stupid to run a motor because this is going to oscillate too fast. But the point is, it's a load. These resistors should be small. They're supposed to be unobtrusive. These are the ones, these capacitors, these resistors, are actually involved in the circuit timing. And I have a formula for that I'll show you later. These resistors are just enough and no more to make sure the load doesn't fry, basically. You want them to be as small as possible so they don't affect the timing. If they do, you can adjust the timing and fiddle fart around with it until it works. It's not gonna ruin the circuit, it'll just make you do more work designing it. We're going to want four connections to the positive power through each of these resistors, a good old power bus. And each of the transistors will dump to ground. So now let me clean this up a bit. That should be all right. So the first thing we have is the power connected through this resistor through the load. Now this is the small one. I'm going to label this as 330 ohms. I'm using the numbers from SparkFun's little tutorial. So this one over here is also 330 ohms with plenty of squeaking and we'll connect the power through this load as well. Let me add some junctions here for clarity. So the load will go through the collector of this transistor and out to ground and this is a simple low side switch. The same over here. The load through the collector and emitter to ground, another low side switch. Let me go ahead and connect the capacitor to its junctions so we know what those are for. And of course I screwed that up. Hold on. I meant to draw it through here. The load goes through the capacitor junction. So the capacitor is in parallel with the load. Like that and like that. So I have the same thing I just drew. Positive power 
through the resistor, through the load, through a spot on the breadboard or whatever, into the transistor and out. So it's this, exactly the same low side switch, but it's connected in parallel with the capacitor. So that's our load part of the circuit. Now the control part. These resistors are much larger. In this case, 47K ohms. So 47,000 ohms. We'll do 47K ohms here. And you're going to have, again, the mirror on both sides because we want a nice even back and forth. If they're not even, then you're going to get different timings on the rise and fall. This is not a PWM generator. It's not as smooth as that. It's not going to generate a regular square wave. It's going to be like a, a hump and then down. But it'll still work as a pulse generator, which is what I'm going to do with it. It doesn't have to be a perfect square wave, but it'll be a regular pulse generator. So these connect power through the resistor and into the capacitors. So now we have our capacitors fully connected. The load is connected to one side, the regular power and resistor connected directly to the other, but we don't have our full circuit yet. There is one more tiny little wrinkle. These are cross connected. Whoop. And this is the beauty in how the circuit works and why it's difficult to explain because this is what's called a positive feedback circuit where you have Let's say this capacitor is being wired over into the transistor over here, and that transistor's operation, because this is the base to emitter junction, the transistor's operation is being controlled by whatever this voltage is, which controls this switch, but this switch goes into this capacitor. So that controls how this capacitor charges and discharges, which connects over into this transistor and controls its switching on and off, which is connected as a low side switch to this capacitor, which switches back to here. So you've got this funky little thing going on like this. So here's the hand wave explanation. The next video will be the real explanation. So at any particular time, one capacitor is charging. Current is flowing through it this way to add positive charge here, negative charge here, which is flowing through the base emitter junction. At the same time, this capacitor is discharging. It had a positive charge here and a negative charge here, but current is flowing through here and out to the collector to emitter passage. And the trick is the act of this capacitor discharging hand wave chokes off the voltage here. There's actually a negative voltage at this spot. So you've got this base has a negative voltage, the emitter has a zero voltage. So the base to emitter junction is reverse biased, the transistor's choked off and not transisting. So that means up here, this is an open switch. So this is connected through power and it's charging. So this capacitor is discharging, choking off this transistor, turning it off, which allows this capacitor to charge, which is not choking off this transistor, which is allowing it to be on, which has got this switch closed. It's passing current. So this end of this capacitor is connected to low, to ground, and it's allowing it to discharge. And the act of this discharging is choking off this, turning it off. So what happens is eventually, as this discharges, right? Because right now, this one's charging, this one's discharging, this transistor is on, so this light is on, that light is off. Eventually, this will run out of charge and it won't have a negative voltage here anymore. It'll stop choking this transistor. This transistor will turn on, which will connect this charged capacitor to ground. It will start discharging, which will choke off hand wave this transistor so that'll turn that transistor off. So this will no longer be connected to ground. So it'll start charging through power. And since this is charging, it's not choking off this transistor. So it's on connected to ground discharging. So this one's on, this light's on, that light's off. That's how it oscillates. At any one particular time, one capacitor is charging and just doing its own little thing. The other capacitor is discharging and preventing one transistor on the opposite side from working. Back and forth, back and forth. Again, take my word for it. In the next video, I will actually use Kirchhoff's voltage and current laws to analyze this step-by-step -step process. Cool. And these capacitors I'm using 10 microfarad, a common number, 10 microfarad electrolytic. Now, there is a formula and I have not left myself room to write it. So since we're done with this anyway, I'm just going to write it here. Frequency equals natural log of two. I do need more room, hold on. 
And there goes everything on the floor, because I really wanted to clean tonight. Oh, gravity, why do you hate me so? So let's try this again. Frequency equals natural log of 2 times. And I'll just write this how SparkFun did. R2 times C1 plus R3 times C2. But this is all divided into 1. It's the reciprocal. F is the frequency. This is how fast it's going back and forth. So how many times it's going to switch per second. This is your RC network. Resistance times capacitance in the RC network is the tau time constant. It's how long it takes the capacitor through the resistor to charge or discharge by about 68%. Now, we were using the same size resistor and capacitor on both sides. It was symmetrical. So we can write this a little nicer, times 2 times R times C. The natural log of 2, it's just a number. It's like 0.7 or something. If you don't know what the natural log is, I might do some math videos in the future, probably the far future. I would just Google it for now. Or just plug it in a calculator and don't worry about it. And then 2, of course. So this gives you about how much it switches per second. And for spark fun, I was using 47 K ohms resistors, 10 micro farad capacitors. So we have natural log of 2, which is about 0.7, times 2, times 47,000, times 10 divided by a million. Calculate all of that, and then 1 divided by that. And in this case, it's about 1.5. So about 1.5 times per second, it's going to switch when I'm using these values. The 330 ohm resistors, remember I said those were just for the load. The resistors connected to the LEDs directly, those are supposed to be as small as possible so that this function works. If those resistors are too large, then it has too much of an effect on this and this doesn't work anymore, and you'll have to fiddle fart with the numbers and try different parts until it does what you want it to do. But if you're using small resistors on your load, whether that load is an LED or the control to a transistor or whatever, then you can just do this and it's close enough. And if you want something more exact, I would recommend using an IC, like a 555 timer or a crystal oscillator or something like that, because this is a simple circuit. This is a great circuit, but there are a lot of things in here that are going to give you inexact oscillation in the short term. In the long term, over the course of a whole operation, hours and hours, it'll be nice and even and wonderful and all the inaccuracies will smooth out. But this is mostly when you only care about the time to be like, I want it to be about a second and a half because it's cheap and simple to wire up. An integrated circuit is, of course, a little more expensive unless you're buying in Superbulk. So without belaboring the point anymore, let me just hook one up. Please excuse the mess. I have been doing some things, and I've had a few setbacks with my research, so that would be why I have been slow to posting videos. I'm still getting used to this whole production thing. Let's see if the zoom function makes this any better. It is an optical zoom, so it's not just upscaling. So I have here my breadboard, which I'm not sure it's focusing on. I'm going to turn my power onto a nice 5 volts. You don't need to see it, it's not doing anything, but I'm not using that yet. So I have here two LEDs, two 330 ohm resistors, two 47,000 ohm resistors, 47K, two 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitors, and two NPN transistors. Symmetry. So let's hook it up. So we'll go from power through a 330 ohm, make sure I'm not blocking it as much as I can. So out of the 330 ohm into an LED, out of the LED into one end, rather the positive end since it's an electrolytic, of one capacitor. But that end is also in parallel connected to the collector of the transistor, the emitter of the transistor, over to the ground. So then we do the low side switch on the other side. Power into A330, from there into the second LED, out of the LED, over to the input of the other capacitor, the input, the positive end, what are words? So the input, the same spot, into the collector of the second transistor, the emitter, over to the negative. And we're already almost done. So then we go through power again into a 47K resistor. From there, we connect to the negative side of the first capacitor, getting a little crowded here, and then from the negative side of that capacitor to the base of the second transistor. So first capacitor, second transistor. So once again, power. Are you focusing? Okay, hopefully. Power to the negative side of the second capacitor, from the negative side of the second capacitor to the base of the first transistor, and we're done. So now, if I turn the current limit up, 
we get, of course nothing, because it's my life. So now we just check our wires. And of course, that would explain what I screwed up. I forgot one of the resistors. Leave it to me to not notice a resistor with no wires on it. So I connected from positive power directly to the negative side of a capacitor. Fortunately, it did not blow up. I'm sure we could analyze the way I wired it up wrong to see if it could have blown up. But anyway, we just put the resistor in there like it's supposed to be. Try that again. And oh look, it works fine. As they say, if you assemble something and you have parts left over, you might want to think about why. So you can see it's roughly-ish one and a half times a second. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand or so. And that's all there is to it. So you can see, instead of LEDs, you could connect it to something else and have that turn on and off, such as something expecting pulses. And you don't have to use both either. You can use just one, if you want. You could put them into an inverter gate or a buffer and use them as a logic on off on off. But you can also, like I'm intending to, put it into an H bridge. Because remember the H bridge has two inputs. To set it going one way, you put high on one side, low on the other. To set it going the other way, you put high on that side, low on the first side. So right now I've got two outputs. At any particular moment, one will be high and one will be low. So I can plug this directly into an H bridge and get a nice flipping signal from it, which I can then use capacitors to smooth. So we are one step closer to our DC to AC converter without using any inductors whatsoever. So the next episode is going to be mathy and brainy. Not advanced math, just the regular addition, subtraction, multiplication we've been doing. But it's going to be a lot of Kirchhoff's voltage and current laws and analysis. So I understand if that bores you, you don't need to listen to it. I would recommend it though because it helps to understand what you're doing. And it would make me feel good because I've spent the past week trying to understand this, including posting on message boards. <gasps> Yes, I've had to resort to that. In any case, while I go prepare that demonstration, I'll be seeing you.